really interested. And you know, I really love the point you made about how um, AI and robotics are parallel to the industrial revolution. We also have a parallel politically going really far to the right. So can you talk a little bit about what happened to the Bauhaus? What actually chased them out? They were targeted as being degenerate. What we need to pay attention to today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I would say that what happened with the Bauhaus is sort of akin to what you're seeing now um, with the attack on journalism, with the attack on, on the arts, with the attack on sort of like progressive thinking. Um, I think it's very easy to scapegoat marginalized communities um, when people are vulnerable in terms of their, their perception on what's going on in the world. So what I'd argue when I say like we're experiencing an existential crisis, what I think is happening is that people aren't sure where they're going, they're not sure what their value is, they're not sure what the future holds. And that makes people quite vulnerable to sort of dogmatic um, and nationalist rhetoric, which says, hey, let's go back to a simpler time, let's revert to the past, and let's blame this concretely on this small sort of subset of people who are progressive thinkers or, or whatnot. So I, I totally agree with you that there's like this sort of parallel happening that's both, um, economic and technological, as well as cultural and social. Okay, so so uh, when you're going around on your tours, um, you're looking at other places that you're going to, uh, what are some of the, like, the uh, ways that other people are uh, exploring and kind of working with different processes, and what are some of the things that you're seeing just kind of going around? Yeah, um, I think I understand your question. Um, so one of the things that became really interesting to me as I started to produce these, these tours, so I've done them in, like all over the world, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Mumbai, Detroit, Mexico City, Sao Paulo, um, San Francisco, so like all over the place. And um, originally when I started doing these, it was when I was at the Institute of Design and we were thinking of it as like a, a different way to um, kind of like, you know, think about the role of design in the world today. And while that became part of what we were doing, what was really striking to me is that in the end it was like really less about design and it was more that like design became this really interesting and useful facilitator for these kind of emerging conversations that we wanted to have. Where maybe people didn't define themselves as designers, they might not define themselves as activists um, or whatever it was that they were sort of doing and representing but they were doing something in a local context that was quite powerful, that could be replicated elsewhere, that was suggestive of a new way, a totally new way of thinking. And I think there are a couple kind of um, themes that became, I think, really um, common throughout the different cities that we visited, even though you know, they were really all so different. Um, one is that you know, these sort of local change makers or leaders were taking a sort of systems design approach to what they were doing. They were thinking not just about, say, creating sustainable uh, food systems. They were also thinking about how that relates to the job market, how they needed to be thinking about the identity of the people that were participating in the system. Um, they were working across public and private partnerships to make the change that they were enacting. What's your thought on the role of convenience in our society? Or the bottomless pit of convenience? Sure. So, um, okay, so I have a lot to say on this. I'm trying to keep it brief. Um, okay, so I was talking with a friend of mine, um, like a professional friend of mine, a couple months ago. And he's like, I have the best idea, Ashley. I think that there should be an app. So every time you get into an Uber, the Uber driver gets a signal that says whether or not um, you want to talk to him or her. He's like, won't that be brilliant? Then you don't have to have that awkward thing where you like, you know, try to you know, like, not talk to your Uber driver when you need to like, you know, do work or whatever. And I was like, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> it's terrible. And he's like, what do you mean? He was a little bit crushed. Um, and the reason I was sort of like so appalled by it is that we have the ability 
to read each other and read each, like read the body language off of the people that were around very quickly and determine uh, whether or not it's time for a conversation or whether it's time to give somebody space. But if we start to dumb down our natural and innate senses to be human, to read each other, and to communicate in both you know, explicit and nonverbal ways, we're actually making ourselves stupider and we're removing the opportunity to connect with one another. So there's a great David Byrne article that you should check out which talks about a lot of kind of like new technology um, and how it's like really been created by a lot of kind of like antisocial engineers who again are like over indexing on, on convenience as a replacement for human connection. Um, and I think it's something that we should be really, really careful about and really skeptical. But you know, my colleagues that are a little bit more sort of like tech positive or optimistic than I am would say over time we find ways to, to filter out the things that aren't working for us and make the technology work for us. And I, I want to believe that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not like, you know, tech free in my, my, in my house. And my son watches television. He's really into um, Lego building right now on YouTube. So he just, like, he loves to play Legos himself. But then he also likes watching other people make Legos, which is really weird to me. <laughs> um, but I let him do it. Um, so I, but I, I do spend a lot of time, like, actually reading physical books to him. And I take a lot of walks with him. And we talk a lot with one another and try to stay um, kind of engaged in real time as much as possible. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, he also has traveled a lot um, with me too. And so I, I try to expose him as well to what is happening around the world in a real way, where he has real physical and tangible visceral memories. And is it just sort of hearing about what's happening um, through a screen? Yeah, so I'm not the director and I'm not even the like, you know, main producer on this film. Um, a lot of my role here is in a lot of the other programmatic things that we're doing, different events, fundraising, um, media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that would be a better question for them. But I will say that my biggest challenge with this has been like, I, I have a, like a, a sort of marriage and commitment to the Institute of Design because of my history there. And so I'm like, and also like I really subscribe to human-centered design as a discipline. And so Maholi Naj had all of these different um, legacies in photography, in art. I mean, it, it's kind of endless. He was super prolific, which I think you probably can grasp from the clip that I shared. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, I'm like biased towards really wanting that design story to come through, um, particularly in terms of how it's relevant today. Um, but there's, there are like so many stories to tell, right? So, um, so that would be like, you know, the thing that's toughest for me, but yeah. Thank you so much. Happy birthday to Korean mornings.